Hey there, everybody. Pete Pardo here from Sea Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of the UK Connection. It's Saturday. Happy weekend, everybody. We got in the co-captain's chairs, as always, Mr. Simon Bray and Mr. Stephen Reed. How are you, gentlemen? I'm good. How's yourself, Simon? How are you? I'm good, and um, i just like it to be known that I'm wearing clothes that actually fit. <laughs> but do you not generally? <laughs> no, I just uh, happened to watch some toll-related uh, fun yesterday, and I saw um, Stephen doing his best Jordan Pickford impression like that. And, uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, I'll have you, I'll have you know that when I was being sensible and serious like this, I was making a making a political comment. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> I actually believe in the political comment that I wasn't making, but there you go. So there right. we are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we enjoyed our night of yellow. That was fun. We were all we yeah, enjoyed the night of yellow. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even if Anthony looked slightly confused at the start, it took him <laughs> way too long to click. <laughs> I should have let him in on the joke, but that, that part oh. of the joke was so he wouldn't know. Right. Yeah. Well, you know. So uh, hopefully you gentlemen enjoyed your St. Patrick's Day. Uh, I figured we would kind of extend St. Patty's Day to today. So, uh, Stephen, what do you got uh, on tap today? Well, is it St. Patrick's Day or was, was it? I didn't know. Sorry. Apologies to everyone that, that really observes that. Um, I've gone with, today I've got a black Galloway. Okay, so I was with my boring day job. I've said that out loud, now you never hear that. Um, I was down in the south of Scotland, trying to kind of the Dumfries area. So this is from the Solworth Brewery. And it's, it's a mean, look at this. It's, it's as black as they come. So I have not tasted this yet. Just poured it out before it come on. It's 4.4. Mm. It oh, hmm. It's very nice, so very smooth. That's excellent, by the way. I've got another one from them as well, something completely different. So I'm looking forward to that. That's really good. There we go. Yeah, mm, nice. Really good. Cool. Simon, how about you? Yeah. Um, what I would say about St. Patrick's Day is that um, I uh, got to work early this morning, went for a little stroll around uh, Preston, like I did last week. And there were people dressed in green looking a little bit the worse for wear at zero eight hundred hours this morning. <laughs> Yeah, tremendous. tremendous. Uh, you gotta love the Irish folks, man. Or, or here in the states, you you don't even have to be Irish for people to start drinking at eight eight o'clock in the morning. It's just this an excuse to get hammered, I guess. Right? Do we need one? Well, I, no, I guess we do. You're absolutely right. I guess we don't. I guess we don't. Yeah. So I, anyhow, I've got um, from the Turning Point Brewery, which is in Nairsborough or Nursborough, as I'd probably say from Lancashire, is um, Hickory Clan Caviar. Look at that. Yeah. What a interesting choice. Maple and Pecan Danish Stout. Haven't had it before. Going to try Ooh. it live. I'm excited by this. Uh, so no apparent reason. I'm just going to put in a little rum uh, jar thing because I can. But also because, um, you know, sometimes we pop on quite a bit, don't we? We do, we do, we do. I've, I've got a second one as well, uh, mainly because it's well out of date. It's um, Old Empire IPA, which uh, is from Marston's, which upsets me a little bit, but I'm, I'll probably have a go at that whilst I'm pretending to listen to uh, what you chaps are saying. Okay. <laughs> pretending, <laughs> he says. Well, to go back to St. Patrick's Day for a second, I don't know if it's still a tradition here, but for as long as I can remember, a really good Scottish tradition for St. Patrick's Day is that Stiff Little Fingers play the Glasgow Barrowlands. They do it every single St. Patrick's Day. Now, obviously, the live shows have been up in the air and various things, so who knows if that's still happening or not. But I remember my brother going year after year after year to go see them. So, yeah, that's that's a good tradition here. So hopefully that's still happened and people enjoy themselves. Well, I am going to keep it crunchy with a little granola stout made by Amagang Brewery up in Cooperstown, New York. Stout with natural flavors and caramel color, 6.5%. We've got uh, brewed with cranberry, honey, cocoa nibs, pecan, oats, and vanilla. I don't know how crunchy it's going to be, but I so like so I'm going to crack that open live. 
All right, here we go. Just don't. Uh... So you've got granola, Peter, and got granola. you have got maple and pecan. Simon, mm -hmm. have have I gone into a time warp? Is it breakfast time? I guess so. You just didn't get the memo, did you? Yeah, I've, I've, I've been stalking behind your back. <laughs> well, everyone does. I've got a serious pint here. So this is a serious proper. Look, this is the the the, the real stuff. Yeah, it's probably it's probably the weakest of the three. <laughs> well, yeah, but you know, you got the storm. The storm. Uh, is that Star storm Wars? Troopers. There we go. Yes, the stormtroopers. I was like, storm, storm, storm. The storm. I haven't even started drinking yet. Not kidding. <laughs> that must be good. One whiff either way. I got the olds. What can I tell you? All right. So, uh, cheers, fellas. That's pretty dark. Let's see. Oh, I feel like I should say something like really uh, pretentious at this point, but that's just good. It's just nice. Nice. This too. Nice. Yeah. It's good. good. I taste All the chocolate. Last week. I don't know about crunchy or vanilla, but I taste the chocolate. Yeah, I was a little worried about the crunchy reference. I, I'm not sure if I want my beer crunchy. Uh, I, I don't know. They're just, I, I guess because it's supposed to taste like granola, they're saying crunchy, but I don't, I, taste, I definitely no taste cocoa. A lot of vanilla, actually, and a little pecan. So I don't know about the cranberry, <laughs> oats. I don't know. Whatever. It's pretty good. Looks good. It's smooth. It's six point five, so it's a little on the higher end for me, but it doesn't taste overly boozy. So um, I'm good with that. So cool. This is very easy on the palate. I've only brought one. I'm going to have to slow down. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be 15 minutes in. You'll be like, oh shit! I'll be right back. <laughs> Ah, all right. Well, now that we got that taken care of, topic at hand, folks. So today is uh, favorite and least favorite albums from a notable band. We're going to do this on occasion. Uh, we tried to pick a band where we all have some differing opinions on and some albums we really like and some that we don't. So today it's all going to be about Judas Priest. So what we have decided to do is we're going to give each one of us is going to give you two albums we really like from Judas Priest two albums we don't like to we, we like the least maybe we don't like it all and then a wild card album and a wild the wild card album is going to be it's not one of the top ones it's not one of the bottom ones it kind of floats somewhere in between could be a studio album could be a middling live album could be an ep could be something along those lines something that kind of sits and floats in the middle kind of like the kind of like the subs in here but um so we'll have Simon kick us off with uh, his two favorite Judas Priest albums. Of all. Oh, oh! I was expecting like a seven-hour uh, Stephen explains who the priests are kind of situation. But uh, oh, and what, everyone, me, what, what can I possibly tell anyone about the priest that they don't already know? Oh, who knows? You know, I mean, I did the second thing that we were entailed of the unexpected there, but there we go. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? Before, as is always the way, before. I actually leap into uh, into these. I did try to do a bit of show and tell. I made some effort this week. Not enough effort, but I made some effort because, as you know, upstairs I've got them. I've got the man cave, and all my CDs up from A to L. It's a bit of a mess, and there's lots of them. And I, I managed to find some some priest. Let's say I managed, managed to find some. Uh, not necessarily all the ones I want to talk about, but I, I <laughs> found that. some priest. Yeah, and this is look, look you like this one in my Angel of Retribution CD. Do you remember I said I put tickets in? I got this beautiful ticket, and by that I mean shit ticket from um, when they played at Manchester Apollo with the Scorpions, which is a terrifying, a terrifying, uh, nearly seventeen years ago. Wow, is it? Wow, because I saw that too, too. That is scary. That's 17 years in whatever the date is, in a few days. Oh, God. Yeah, and um, Scorpions blew them off stage, it has to be said. They did in Glasgow as well. So it's really, what's really interesting, so Simon, as soon as you said that you went and actually found some CDs for show and tell today, I knew that you were going to have some ticket stubs, because for those of you who are paying attention week after week after week, we do continue themes and little tidbits from week to week that if you weren't watching every week, you would not have heard Simon say on numerous occasions that most of his ticket stubs are not in a nice, wonderful, organized booklet like Stephen or myself, but are stuck in CDs in the man cave. So 
there you have the first appearance in, of the UK connection from Simon of a ticket stuff. Gotta love it. See? <laughs> Indeed. Just wait, wait till you see our fourth John Parr into this conversation as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I tell you, if you do, if you do, I would need to hand it to you. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we've just done it. Um, yeah, what, I, what I would like to say when, you, when, when I'm thinking about the priest is, is firstly, I, I, I did say to you off air last, last week, because we've been thinking about this for a while, that, you know, I don't think there are that many. If any stinkers from the priest, I have revised. I have revised that situation wholesale, let me tell you. Um, however, what I did notice when I was um, doing the research, you know, which is unusual for me, is actually you think, oh, the priests are like really popular. And do you know what? The charts tell us a, a different story. Just sit back for a second while I read this out as if I was Stephen Reid. Um, so the chart positions in the UK, by sin after sin, made 23, stained class at uh, 27, killing machine, 32, unleashed in the studio, 10, uh, British Steel, 4, points of entry, 14, uh, screaming for vengeance, 11, defenders of the faith, 19, are oh, you seeing a pattern here? Um, Turbo, 33, priest life, 47, ram it down, 24. These are not huge selling albums, are they, in, in the UK? Uh, Painkiller, 26. Um, Angel of Retribution, the comeback album that I just showed you, made 39. Rob Halford came back. Yeah, that's what it says on the official charts um, website. So, so it must be true. Yeah. Nostradamus, <laughs> more of which later, um, number, <laughs> number 30, Redeemers of Soul, 12. And Firepower, again, more of which later, uh, number five. And you, and you think, well, you know, what a big band they are. The yeah. stats tend to suggest that, you know, actually they are like a pretty hardcore kind of metal, metal band that have a, a, an audience and um, then not much to go after that initial first week. Uh, I think they only have two multi-platinum albums here in the States. And I believe that's Screaming for Vengeance and uh, Defenders of the Faith, if I'm, if I'm remembering. A lot of gold albums, at least up to mm. a point. But yeah, I mean, they're not, they're not Van Halen. They're not Led Zeppelin, right? They're not Guns N' Roses, but I think influence, you know, more of the legendary band, more than album sales, I guess. Mm. I think there's an interesting kind of thing where a lot of the bands that have been in the sphere of music that we talk about here, massive, mm. when you look at the sales, they're not all that, but in terms of what they can shift in ticket sales, yeah. That's a different thing entirely. Now, yeah. same again, even though they are still and always have been big news in the UK, in the US and South America and places like that, the priest can play ginormous places. Oh, yeah, yeah. But they don't necessarily and haven't necessarily always shifted units. I think that's true of a lot of really popular heavy metal bands. And I think there are really actually only quite a few that have managed to move the ticket sales into the charts. And that's why I'm often amazed by the, the sort of bands that I think people will have heard of outside of, you know, mad metal mothers like us. Okay. And you speak to them about it and they all go, who? But that's what I think. But I go to like stadiums or big venues and there's like 10,000 people there. How can nobody know who this band are? But that, it, but it seems to be a kind of weird quirk where you can get really big numbers in a venue for a show. And yet outside of there, because it's not on the radio, certainly over here, not on the radio, not on the TV, not covered in mainstream press, your average guy in the street just goes, mm. it's a bit weird. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. Sorry, Simon. That said, um, albums tend to, as I, as I know I've said before, it gives you that kind of sense of a time and the place. And I know that intellectually there are better albums than the one I'm about to name, but couldn't find. Yeah. Because I'm a huge fan, controversially, possibly, who knows, of Turbo. Yes. Yes, I am. There you go. I, I, I love this record. I really, really love it. it it's... um. It's got, just got great songs up until 
uh, wild nights, wild nights, hot and crazy days. I think up till there, it's just <laughs> absolutely stonking record. You know, really, really, really good tunes. You know, who doesn't love Turbo Lover? Quite a lot of people, actually. Uh, yeah. Parental <laughs> guidance. Yeah. You know, do we need any parental guidance? Well, let me tell you, 17-year-old me did not. No, no, I didn't. What a tune. Private property. Uh, for now, for now. Yeah, you know, well before um, Steel Panther. Um, Rock you all around the world. The first six or seven songs on this are just absolutely brilliant. You know, it's almost as if, and this is a thing with the priest, you've had a little look around, seeing what's going down, and then kind of priested it up. It's not the first time or the last time that they, that they would do that. And it is, um, it's a very, very accessible uh, record for me. So Certainly for me, because it's like not too heavy, quite a few, you know, Synthesizer guitars and stuff that people didn't like. But do you know what? Tune wise, I just absolutely loved it. I, I did. I do. Doesn't mean I know where, exactly where my copy is because do you know what? I can always stream it anytime I want to, but it's up there somewhere. Maybe I'll find it later. But um, <laughs> car, car. You know, there's only so many CDs you can keep in the car. True. Yeah, there you go. I managed or, to you, know, you, can, you can do the car when I go. I, you know, I don't want to go back to the back to the past when I when when you when you had a CD Walkman. Oh God, no! When you can walk around, you know. You know let me tell you, I wasn't listening to a CD Walkman when I was seeing the Irish people at eight o'clock in Preston this morning. Oh no! <laughs> Screaming away, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoying. Oh no, I wasn't thoroughly enjoying the priest at that point. More of that later. Anyhow. Moving on to my second choice, which I could find because I know where all my vinyl is, because that's just the kind of guy that I am. And do you know what? And I think, again, I think we've said this before. I don't like to shit on bands' new releases. And I love Firepower. I absolutely adore this record. Reminding myself of how much, not, not really like the Get Fold Sleeve. Yeah, I'm sure you were mighty could have slagged that one off, couldn't you? But um, ah, what a great record from beginning to end. Just, just you know, these people are 300 years old and they've made an absolutely brilliant sounding record. Yeah. Because it, re it really does sound great. Um, great songs. Um, and I am a huge fan of, of, of legacy bands still making music. Yeah. I loved Ozzy's last album. Really, really loved it. Played it, played it today. Deep Purple. You're making faces again, aren't you, Stephen? Yeah, I stopped when you said. I'm not on board with the Ozzy album, but everything else no, you said has been right. Oh, you know what? I'm, I'm on board with a purple album. Excellent. Me too. Um, you know, I really love the last couple of Sticks albums. You know, I think you know what ha what happens with these bands is people go, "How long the classics were forty years ago?" But you know what? They're still making uh, excellent music, and particularly side side one or side A, whatever it is of this, uh, the title track, Lightning Strikes, Evil Never Dies, because it doesn't, does it? That's what Evil's like. Just absolutely phenomenal. Really great record. Love it. Play it all the time still. So yeah, I agree. It's I know they they've got another one that they're planning. I don't know. They they got they got some hard work to do to top that one because I thought Firepower was amazing. I, I like it a lot. And, uh, and speaking of great new albums by legacy bands, how about that new Saxon? Have you guys heard it? Oh, it's so yes. Oh. I mean, this, their standard is always remarkably high, but it's outstandingly yeah. good. Yeah, really good. And they're coming to Blackburn in November, which is just six miles from where I'm sat. Just for I, you, Simon. You will yeah, be there, I take it. Like, duh. It's just after my birthday. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, very cool. All right, well, two good choices. Uh, you surprised you. me with Turbo, but hey, I mean, Turbo is kind of fun. I mean, yeah, that's I get, it. I get. It. I know a lot of people hate it, but <laughs> um, no, I get it. That's code for I completely disagree, and that's <laughs> fine. That's perfectly, perfectly fine. Wait till you've spoken. <laughs> All right, Mister Reed, with with the banging Europe shirt, War of Kings is a plug. Great freaking album, right there. Absolutely. That, that, this here is what people call art. Yes, that's right. That's right. It's not the final countdown, though, is it? No, it's not. Thank it's God. Not. And that's a good thing and a bad thing. Yeah. 
So I'm really glad that you mentioned firepower because I, I'm not going to mention firepower, but only because this catalogue is just crammed with great albums. But yeah, I'm all about supporting current bands, new albums, and the legacy bands who are thankfully still putting out lots of great new music. And Firepower is up there with Priest's best albums. Not in my own personal top two, but it's not far away. So I'm going to start with Screaming for Vengeance. I'm going all the way back to 82. The, I mean, the album art is fantastic. You know, it, it just it says everything that you need to know. I really liked the kind of era album art wise and various things at this point because they really had a theme and a feel and there was that kind of metal men that they were kind of building that sort of mystique round about them. But I mean, as the openers go, the Hellion into Electric Eye, I mean, that's just outstandingly good. And then you've got Screaming for Vengeance, you got another thing coming. That's just, it's great. And it's been interesting because these are one of these bands where I think, you know, I know basically nearly all of these albums back to front. But it's not until you really think to yourself, right, okay, I can only talk about two that I really like. I'm going to have to listen to six or seven to work out now, all these years down the line, which two. But the, the breadth of what this band cover, because they do heavy rock that's really accessible. They do hard rock into metal, and they do almost, you know, heavy metal into thrash at certain points. But they all sound like Judas Priest. Well, they nearly all sound like Judas Priest. There's some obvious exceptions to that rule, some of which later has to be said. But at this point, they were really finding a signature sound, I think. You know, I mean, even the less celebrated stuff like Bloodstone, that's got a huge groove, hooks to die for, the chorus in Devil's Child, that, it's catchy as hell. Do you know, Devil's Child, it's catchy as hell. Anyway, I, I've worked on this rubbish. Okay, and the guitar line that's... Here we go, talking up. about that evil music again, God damn it. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but I mean, the guitar line that sits up at the back of that chorus is that genius. That second beer is going to come in handy about another minute. <laughs> uh, yeah, everyone feels I don't that think I wasn't paying attention, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it pushes at the right time and it pulls at the right time. I think personally for me that even though this isn't my innovative commas number one, which changes all the time, I think in terms of the balance between the five guys in the band at this stage, it's just perfection. There's no one dominating. There's Halford's outstanding. The guitar pairing are phenomenal. Ian Hill is what he is. He's, in my humble opinion, not the best bassist in the world, but he holds it all down, keeps it all in place. It's Dave Holland on drums at this stage. He just does a great job on this. He just does everything that's needed. There's not a huge amount of flash from him, but I also think that Tom Allen's production is really, really on the money here. It's really absolutely on the money, and I think that what he did with Priest is really where he was at. Um, I would probably admit that there are more consistent Priest albums in the catalogue, but this to me has higher highs than even some of those ones that are maybe more consistent. So yeah, that, that's my first choice is Screaming for Vengeance. My second is one that I didn't really connect with when it was first released, because that was the Priest, the Screaming for Vengeance, Defenders of the Faith, British Steel, that kind of, it's heavy, and it is, it's definitely metal, but it's not really massively in your face. There's hooks and there's choruses, and I'm not suggesting that there's not that on this next album, but they weren't really the metal mothers that they were on Painkiller. And this has been my favorite Priest album for quite some time now. So 1990, Halford's last before he decided to paint himself white and have a black goatee beard and do bizarre things in a bed sheet. And other things if you've read his book, but anyway, that's another story entirely. Um, but it really took me a long time to appreciate this. Yeah, it's an, that's a really interesting read. Oh, look oh. at that. Look at that. I was just waiting for the right time to pull that. There you go. <laughs> well, at the risk of bursting your bubble, I, I actually borrowed it from a friend. I must admit that when I handed it back, he went, what did you think? And I said, well, I'm really glad that you paid for it. <laughs> It's a good read and it's an interesting read. It's a book that happens to be about a guy that may or may not have been in Judas Priest. 
Mm. That, yeah. yeah, there's, I mean, there's yeah. a yeah, lot we, of. We could do a whole uh, derailment mm. of this episode talking about that. It is a good yeah. one. It's just I, not. I, 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 it's not yeah, it's not a whole. Here's my autobiography. I'm the singer of Judas Priest, and here's my story in Judas Priest. It's more about here's my personal story. Oh yeah, and I'm the singer of Judas yeah. Priest. Right? Yeah. yeah. There's an, and I'm I'm not going to try and sidetrack this too much. <clears throat> it's my speciality. Um, it's come up often in the Hudson Valley Squares, though, about certain other bands. Was it Mastodon having a go at Rob for not being, you know, the, the metal god? I think the point they were trying to make is that, and I love the guy to bits, but I think that Rob now actually believes that. I don't think he thinks he's Rob metal god Halford. I think he thinks he is the metal god. I, I, it's a little odd when you read some of that book where you think, are you believing this hype? It's, I find little bits of it uncomfortable in that sense, but it's a very interesting read. Anyway, painkiller. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, Halford is just outstanding on this. Oh, yeah. Absolutely outstanding. He is going for the throat, but the control that he's got, the power that he's got, the precision that he's got, he made it, funnily enough, impossible to follow him. That's what this album did, because it's a vocal masterclass. But he has, in Tipton and KK Downing, he's got a guitar pairing that are absolutely up for this. Hell Patrol, I mean, it tempers the attack of, of, of the opening title track, which is just fantastic. But you've got stuff like Leather Rebel, which just goes right back into that more refined melodic metal side. But All Guns Blazing, it, Oh, it is, it's all guns blazing. I mean, it's it does exactly what it says on the tin. Scott Travis is fantastic on this. There's another unsung hero of this band, in my humble opinion. He's ridiculously good on this. And yet, I mean, I do have a, a vinyl of it through in a different room somewhere, and I've picked up the CD because I've, I've got the nice box that makes them all easy and nice to find. Oh, nice. Very, very nice indeed. I do like this, I have to say. Um, but side one on Painkiller, I think it's the best side of music that Judas Priest put together. Side two is good, but side one, I think, is the best side of music that Judas Priest put together. Uh, and that is that is my favourite, and it's been that way for quite some time now. So that's that's my two. Screaming for Vengeance and Painkiller are the two that, I, right now, I would say are my favourite piece songs. Interestingly enough, two albums that I think solidified the Priest's return to really heavy heavy metal after a couple of albums or in each instance one album that maybe a little on the light side or you know whatever like you know ram it down was kind of received kind of strangely and of course um uh, um Turbo. no the, the one right before screaming for vengeance i'm drawing a blank um desert plains uh jesus what the hell is the name of that album <laughs> I'm like, I got the olds, holy point, cow. Point of entry. Point of entry, that's the one. Yeah, good, good album, but kind of light, right? So yeah, so Screaming for Vengeance came out. It's like, holy shit, Priest is back in a big way, right? Same thing with Painkiller. That's, I remember the first time I heard the Painkiller song, I'm like, Jesus, what is, yeah. this is like the heaviest thing they've done since Screaming for Vengeance, right? So yeah. All right, so my two favorites uh, have not changed in like a million years. And as much as I, you know, went through the whole discography again over the last week or so, and uh, when it comes down to it, you like what you like, right? And uh, like Simon mentioned before, a lot of it, it's historical. It's where you were when you listen to certain albums and certain songs and all that kind of stuff. And as a lifelong Judas Priest fan, uh, my favorite album always of Judas Priest, and it's one of my favorite albums of all time, is Stained Class. Uh, for me, it's the early part. I, I love all eras of Priest for the most part, but the, something about the 70s stuff just does it for me. And this album, I mean, you know, when you've got Exciter and uh, Stained Class, Invader, Saints in Hell, Savage, Beyond the Realms of Death, and there's other good songs on here. Man, and this album sounds good. I mean, this to me, Black Sabbath invented what we now call heavy metal, but the heavy metal that we really knew going into the 80s kind of started with these couple of albums here. I mean, the, the whole look and the production and the, that that's this is heavy metal. Right. Uh, so that's my number one. And my number two came kind of before this, but was their first album where Priest, I think, really became a heavy metal band. That's Sad Wings of Destiny. And again, 
you've just got some classics on these two albums. I mean, Victim of Changes, The Ripper, uh, Tyrant, Island of Domination, Dreamer, Deceiver. I mean, this is, I wish the production of this was like this, because I think this album is just immense. Not the best sounding album on the planet, but man, the songs are here. This is Halford truly becoming Rob Halford in a big way. And uh, yeah, I just, these are two early metal classics and I love so many other Priest albums, but when it comes down to it, if I had to pick my top two, it's generally always these two. And, you know, Sin After Sin usually comes right after and Scream for Vengeance is right after. I absolutely love Firepower and, you know, Defenders is great. Hellbed for Leather is great. I mean, there's so many killer albums, but, uh, and I, you know, I like a lot of the newer ones as well, with the exception of one of them, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But um, yeah, these are my two favorites, without a doubt. It was not even a question. So back to Simon for the least favorites. Yeah, I feel like, um, the cho- you know, the cho- generally the choice that I made for the, uh, for my favorites, you know, <clears throat> the, the there is a right answer, and Stephen's pretty right. Actually, the best Priest album is Painkiller. But I wanted to talk about other things. You know, a fucking great record, phenomenally heavy. But I wanted to talk, I wanted to point out they've done other great things. But I, I just couldn't get away from the uh, the two shitty ones, and I feel like we might agree on at least one of them. I'm very confident. Um, I don't like Ram It Down. Which is weird because aren't they just cast offs from uh, Turbo? Half of it is, yeah, but I agree. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. such a pale album compared to Turbo, isn't it? It is, and I, and I know it's kind of hypocritical of me to say that. Um, you know, again, the, you know, the guitars are really good, but the songs are so inconsistent. Yeah, yeah. you know, it's, it's a heavier album than Turbo, but heavier in this case does not mean good, right? It, that's right, because the songs yeah. aren't there, yeah, yeah. I mean. Loves that. Oh, God. Really? No, just let's no, no. And of course, importantly, and this is really important, and I know we can all agree, they break the Chuck Berry rule. Yes, I was waiting for that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you knew it was coming. The album is actually the worst song that's on it. Yes. Well, it, it's a great song, you know, but oh, oh, yeah, it, didn't need, it, it didn't, it didn't need priesting up. It really, you know, it just, it just, and, and I know, I know they made it for a film and stuff like that, but, but it, it, it doesn't need to exist. And to a large extent, they could they could have just gone bypassed, ram it down. I assume they had to put products out at this point. Uh, it's no, no. But it's Would you guys agree worst. that their version of Johnny Be Good might be the worst thing on any of their albums, or close to it? As a, as an entire actual song that isn't forty six seconds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I probably, I'm going to have to agree with that statement. Yeah, it's pretty turgid, and I, no. I don't think I've quite listened to every album in the catalogue because there were two or three that just sit in the middle. They were never going to be worse. They were never going to be best for me. But I, the albums I've listened to, I haven't skipped a single song other than one, <laughs> and that 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 was the one because it started, and I thought I just don't need to hear this ever again. It's that bad, and it is that bad. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> Fact. Glad we're, on, <laughs> glad we're on the same page. I'm, I'm sure this will this will not be the uh, final um, appearance this evening of drumroll, please, Nostradamus. Fuck, <clears throat> lads. Seriously, what were you thinking? I just who who? who oh, yes, fabulous. Spin it round while I'm talking, Stephen. Um, oh, just, who, 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 who would have thought that in two, was it two thousand and eight, something like that? Who would have thought that, um, yeah, that young, that in in an age where young people have the attention span of a goldfish, that you know, a seventeen hour, uh, thank you, thank you, um, concept album was the way forward, and I, I appreciate it's not really seventeen hours; it's only is it one hundred and two minutes. Something like that. Yeah. It's it, that, that's that's about ninety minutes too long, you yeah, know. And I love the pre- and there are things about this that I really like. I like prophecy, but do you know what? Much of it just kind of just reminds me. And this is like the worst thing in the entire world. It's a bit like um, Les Mis. 
Yeah, I'm going for it. I'm calling. I'm calling it out. It's a bit. It's a bit like Les Mis, you know. Which I think we can all agree is the worst thing ever committed to celluloid. <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> it's it's pretty. It's pretty shocking. And bits of it. I'm seriously. Bits of it uh, just come off in that kind of. I'm singing. I'm giving some exposition. Here we go. Just cut out the shit, play some metal. Thank you, thank you very much. You know, you know, and, you know the plans they had to take it on tour. I mean, who would who would have gone to see that? But but come on, it opens with "I am Nostradamus." Yeah, I mean that's great, isn't it? And you think, <laughs> and then you're walking, or you know, you sat there going, uh, "Don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't like it." That said, though, you know, and th this is the kind of shit that, that like, kind of um, uh, goes through my mind that maybe I don't know. 19 minutes past four this morning. A Les Mis style stage version of pre songs would be fucking awesome. I don't mean that, but, um, you know, <laughs> what? We're breaking the what? You know, that sort of thing as you, you know, as you're walking around, you know, this is the painkiller. You know, <laughs> just completely excellent. United, 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 we stand. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Quickly, let's get let's get in touch with the priest and uh, let's 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 give them that idea. I feel like I think I feel like that's you know, it's the way forward. This is this is how we're gonna make money. Should we should be copywriting this idea? <laughs> <laughs> oh well, um, yeah, it's just um Gobble, gobble, it's a bit of a turkey. Yeah. Do you know, do you know that this, I listened to this to, to make sure that this was in my bottom two. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> I, I actually liked this more than I ever thought that I would admit to, and now everyone knows. It's not, it doesn't stink of shite quite as much as I thought it did. So I think that we all... <laughs> I Tune it out. We all need to revisit this with a slightly less cynical eye. I have revisited it more than once this week to make sure it's as shite as I think, and it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not on my bottom two, but I, I can't argue too hard, Simon. No, I, I can't actually. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so... so I, I, that, those are my bottom two. Ram, that's your Ram it down. Good. And Nostradamus. All right. well, you've made me feel guilty then, is what you've done. You've made me feel mm -hmm. guilty because I have the top two was difficult because I could easily choose another three or four albums and swap them in and out. <clears throat> but I'm happy with the two I went with. The bottom two I found remarkably difficult. Now, partly because I didn't just want to throw the same two albums under the bus. I didn't just want, well, I won't get ahead of myself. I feel bad because what I've actually gone for is this. Okay, so it's it's rock and roll up. We're right back to the start. And I just don't like it very much. It's not a bad album. It's just not really a pre-style. I mean, obviously it is. And, and the phrase that people use with this album, and they are right, and thankfully back in 1974, it was also true is that every band's got to start somewhere. These days, every band's got to start somewhere and then they get binned after an album if nobody's interested. Thank God that that's not what happened back in the mid seventies, because in the back of this album, I think had this been released now, people would just have gone, next. So you know, Frontiers wouldn't have actually renewed their contract if this had come it's out. Yeah. <laughs> right, I, I mean, it's a compromise album. Rob is only, you know, barely in the band, is only involved in half the songs in terms of creation. And it sounds like that. Is it a blues album? Is it a heavy rock album? It's a bit psychedelic in places. It's all a, the, it's all a the above. Mix. All the above. Yeah. It's a bit of a They're mess. trying to figure out what, what the hell they want to do album. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> it's a bit of a mess. And I know you think because I can't actually find the one with the Coca Cola lid, the Rock and Roll lid on the top. And it's, I think the last time I saw it was expensive. <laughs> I still yeah. quite like it, even though I don't like the album very much. But it's forgivable because it's, it is the debut and it does kind of set the path. But I put it on the other day. I don't like it. That that's and that to me outweighed it against Nostradamus. Nostradamus is a folly. That that for a band at that stage having already had a folly, 
you know, when the band split. They just didn't need to do Nostradamus. But when I listened to those two albums back to back, well, I'll listen to Nostradamus again if you make me. Rock a roller, please don't. But it's not that bad. And that says a lot about the whole catalogue. But what I really didn't want to do was I didn't just want to choose the two Ripper albums because it felt a bit easy. But I did have to choose one of them <laughs> because <laughs> to me, otherwise, it's a lie. Um, and I went for, and it really, I went for, I went for demolition. Okay, and there's a variety of reasons. Some are totally valid, and some are totally valid, but for different reasons. Jugulator, okay, which one has a garbage title for a start. That's a, just a, even by priest standards, that's a stupid name for an album. Yeah. It's got compromised album art, okay, because when you open it, I thought I brought it through, but it happened. But when you open the Jugulator booklet, you see the album art pulled back as it's meant to be, the full image. That's what Mark Wilkinson created. That was meant to be the album art. And some wise person somewhere went, oh, but the figure's too small. Let's zoom in and pixelate the damn thing. All blurry, yes. Oh, it's just, it, it, it's a great piece of art utterly ruined. They couldn't even be bloody well bothered with this. Every album, every album that they've released, with one or two exceptions, has got good album art, and they couldn't even be asked with this. I don't care, and I'm, I'm the gimmick guy, that it comes with a sticker, and it comes with a plectrum. I don't care, because they didn't care. They don't care about that album. It just sounds like they could not be asked, and that's what I hate about it more than anything else. Jugulator, at least, they bothered to sit down and produce it. They gave it a sound. It is in inverted commas, cohesive. It's not great, but it is cohesive from start to finish. Demolition, it's got modern metal elements in there. I mean, what are the, thanks very much, bonus tracks. Rapid Fire. I mean, they actually shit on their own song. They shit on their own song. It's got rap and just garbage in it. You listen to it and you go, you guys wrote that. And then, just to top it off, they put the Green Man Alishi, you know? And they kill that too. And that sums up the whole thing for me. The, the, the stuff that's meant to entice me, and I'm an idiot, I did, to buy the fancy fold-out, you know, isn't this the nice package, the blah, 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 it's got the sticker and the plectrum, and it's got two bonus songs. The rest of no it, nice package is going to help that out, my friend. <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest and say that Tim Ripper Owens is a good singer. He's not my favourite. And really in anything that he's in, he's not my favourite. He does a good job everywhere he goes, but he tends to end up in projects or bands that you can comp compare him against somebody else. And when you do that, when you compare his work with Iced Earth, which I like, with the other singers, well, yes, I'll agree with that. When you compare him against, and admittedly, someone that is incomparable, I mean, he comes off way second best. But even when you hear him in some of the other projects that he's been in, is it, 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 he's nearly but not quite. It's always, yeah, he's, he's really capable. I don't know if I want capable when I listen to an album like this. I want blow your bloody mind off. Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, boom! The whole thing explodes. I want painkiller, is what I want. And Jugulator, I think he tried to ape Halford and he got so much stick for it that they said to him on this one, don't do that. Please don't do that. And it just makes him really boring. It makes him really boring on this. But then again, in the same way, and we may cover this at some stage in the future as well, that happened with another massive British heavy metal band when they released two albums with a different singer. What really falls down is that the band, the band let the singer down because Tim Ripper Owens is good enough that if they'd given him a really shit hot set of songs to go and sing, that people would have gone, well, he's not Rob Halford, but I tell you what, that album's really good. And they didn't. They handed him a pile of steaming shite and said, you confront that. I mean, the picture in the middle of this album 
right? When you take this out, he is the only guy that wants to be there. He's the only guy that wants to be there. Oh, wow, wow, wow. The other four guys are all going. Again, oh, we're back to playing clubs again. Damn it. Rob. Anyone, anyone seen Rob? <clears throat> hey, Tim, do you know Rob? <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, yeah, that's my least favourite. And I could have chosen Jogulator, but it, it edges this out, I think, by quite a distance, to be fair. I dislike it more than Rock and Roller, but I didn't just want to throw them both mm. under the bus, because that's not fair on the singer. But it's the band that let him down on both, to be fair. But Demolition is just terrible. It's terrible. It's don't, like put, don't put that away. A barrel on it. <laughs> don't put that away. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab one from each of you on this one. So yeah, my... Uh, Demolition is one of my two at the bottom of the barrel. Uh, yeah, this album is kind of an embarrassment to Judas Priest, in my opinion. Um, the songs suck. They're not memorable. It sounds to me like they're just trying to crank out a modern sounding metal album to try and appeal to all the young kids who are listening to like new metal and metalcore and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't work. Uh, I agree with you when it comes to Ripper. I personally like Ripper's voice, but the fact of the matter is Ripper sounds best when he's doing his Halford thing. That's just the way it is. That's the way he sings. When it's almost like they told him on this album, like you said, try and do something a little bit different. He doesn't sound good on this album at all. It's like, he's trying to be someone other than himself. And you know what, if himself is, is sounding like Halford, well, that's Tim Ripper Owens. And that's, that's what he does well. Cause if you listen to all the other albums he's ever done, that's that's kind of his thing and he's he's great at it right but that album is a mess the songs are laughable and you got these couple like moody like slow songs that are just like what is this all about there's there's just nothing good about that album the album production is terrible and i know tipton had a tipton basically wrote and produced that entire album so that's kind of all on him right because none of the other guys wanted to take part in anything Ripper's not writing any songs. The other guys aren't or helping arrange and everything. That's like a complete Tipton thing right there. So yeah, that album is a complete mess, a disaster. Jugulator isn't great, but Jugulator at least is listenable. Demolition is not. So there's that. My other least favorite, no surprise here, is Nostradamus. <sighs> now, you know, my, my good friend Chris Allo has stated many times here on the channel that this is the worst album ever in the history of rock and roll i don't know if i'd go that far and i know that the five people who love this album as the greatest Jews priest release in the history of this band are going to be watching this episode and they're going to tell us how we're all nuts for thinking this album is so bad and it's the greatest thing ever well that's all fine and dandy I hate to tell you it isn't but here's the thing somewhere in this double album just complete meandering mess of the thing here might be 35 to 40 minutes of something pretty decent, right? There, there is some decent stuff on here. I just, I don't want to hear Judas Priest singing like rock opera concept type. I just, it just doesn't, Priest is a metal band. Stick to what you know best, right? I mean, it's just, this is just boring, meandering. Oh, that's a, that's, that's a pretty decent song. And then I have to sit through four others that are not, right? So condense this down. Maybe you got what, seven, eight tracks on here that, would make up a halfway decent album and halfway decent album would mean probably still in the lower rungs of the Judas Priest catalog, but still not the steaming pile of boring that is this. So yeah, I, I don't like this album. And then like, I don't remember, I think it was Steven, you said you listened to this recently just to make sure to see if you still like it as little as you used to. Uh, I did that a couple of months ago and I don't remember why. If this came up on another show we were doing here on the channel, I'm like, let me go re-listen to Nostradamus just to see if I still feel the same way. It's so hard to get through. This is like an hour and a half of my time that I'll never get back or however long it is, whatever. 90 minutes, 80 minutes, 110 minutes, 50 minutes. doesn't matter. It's too long. It's just too now, long. When, when I listened to this, I will, I will honestly admit that it is years since I've listened to this until this week. So my expectation levels were where Chris Allo's are. I, I, I was willing to stand up and say, this is one of the worst heavy metal albums that I own it might still well fall into that kind of lower echelon. However, I came to the conclusion that you've just come to there, that there's enough on here to have made a single disc or a vinyl length 
decent album. Now, by decent, the conclusion I came to was that if you gave it to King Diamond, it would be the worst King Diamond album that he'd ever made. Because that's what it reminded me of. It's that kind of overblown, riff-infused theatrical stuff that he does fantastically. Yeah. And this would be the worst album that he would even consider releasing if you took the best material on here. So it was better than I anticipated, but what I anticipated was not good. <laughs> and the fact that it's been all those years, I do like to give things another go, but it's been all those years. And I just look at it and it just sits on the shelf and goes, I am Nostradamus, and I can't do it. <laughs> so funny story. So there is in the Guinness Book of World Records, there is a guy out there who apparently has listened to this album like a million times. And he's in the Guinness Book of World Records for having listened to an album more than anybody else in the history of the world has ever listened to any album. And it's this one. So, you know, this came up on, got like two years ago or whatever on the channel. It was some, I don't even remember what the show was. Chris and I, Chris Allo was on it and we were joking about this album. He mentioned that. And like three weeks later, I get an email from some guy who watches Sea of Tranquility, who is best friends with the guy who's in the Guinness Book of World Records for listening to this more than any other human being in the history of the world. And he's like, oh, we'd, lo we'd love to come on the show and talk about it and, and talk about the album. And I'm just like, I don't know if I really want to talk about this album any more than I already have. I think I've given it enough time as it is, right? Here we are again today doing it. So yeah, I don't know. So for if you're, if you're watching out there, if you've listened to this album like a thousand, two thousand, three thousand times, whatever it is, you're a better man than me because I there was no way in hell you could pay me any amount of money that I would sit through Nostradamus a thousand times. Just, just not, not happening, not happening. But if you love it, and if you're one of the people who think it's their crowning achievement, God bless you. That's great. All right, I don't have to think that. Simon doesn't have to think that. Yeah, yeah I'm going to put it back think. upstairs, and it may never make another appearance again. <laughs> I mean, I, I opened this to show it, and I probably can't find it now, but it pains me that there is such good artwork in here, because the, the, the booklet actually is beautiful. Well, it's a package. It's, it's, it's great looking. beautiful. It's such a fantastic thing, and it pains me because I've taken it down off the shelf so few times that I just forgot. I just forgot that this is such a beautiful looking thing, but it's a beautiful looking thing. It is. It that is. is the problem. I, I mean, even though it is beautiful, I didn't really buy it to look at it which is dark because I buy all these fancy editions, but I didn't and buy here's, it. Here's the crazy thing. And Stephen, I know you can appreciate this. I should love this album. Mm -hmm. Knowing all that I really get into and that I like, I love concept albums. I love these big spectacle things, you know, these, these big production albums. I mean, look, I, you know, got Operation Mind Crime and Tommy and, well, you know. The, the one of the best albums of this year, one of the best albums of this year, Peter, Star One. Right, exactly, right, exactly, it's, which is... It's overblown, it's yeah. grandiose, it's got ideas that should be above its station that are not because it's so good. It's a right. great album, and it comes from the same school of thought as this album. It does, but yeah. that works, this doesn't. Yeah. And maybe this is just something that Priest never should have undertaken, I don't know. I always wanted to love it. When it first came out, I was like, yes, Nostradamus, great storyline, double album, Priest, yes. And then you play it and you're like, the fuck is this? Right? Do you, do like, you I'm know? Fall, I'm falling asleep here. Come on. It's like, what? To, to circle back into the show that we did two weeks ago, we spoke about Gene Simmons. Okay, and that seems a bit tenuous. But I showed a book called Odyssey about the elder kisses misguided not in my humble opinion but misguided concept album and the problem reading that book is fascinating because all the people who now have 2020 hindsight are all going that kiss saw that as their artistic statement everyone will say that we are you know just the the, the brightest the cleverest the smartest the most artistic metal band that there's ever been because or hard rock band in their case, because we'd just done The Elder when they did listening parties and people were not allowed to talk during it. This is art that you're listening to now. I think Priest thought that's what Nostradamus was. I agree. And I think when you go in with that intention, you're going to end up with a pile of garbage at the other end. Just write a good album. If that happens to be a concept album, well, there you go. You know, Kiss and Priest are great at what they do, but they're not yes. 
They're not Queensryche. They're not Dream Theater. They're not the Who. It's just this is the way it is, right? I mean, give them credit. You know, hey, more power to you for trying it. Didn't work. Didn't work. It doesn't make me love them any less, right? But it's just that just doesn't work for me at all. So, no. Oh. Anyway, we have we have destroyed on Nostradamus. I think long enough. I think we we should just cease and desist any more Nostradamus discussions on this channel. But anyway, until next year, we'll, we'll I'm sure it'll rear its head once again. Simon, you got a uh, a wild card for? Uh, I do. I do. I do. I do. I do. I do. As Abba so memorable saying, yeah, um, yeah, pleased with myself there. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan. This isn't what I want to talk about. I'm a big fan of Redeemer of Souls. I think oh, you got, hell got, yeah. got the shit back, really got the shit back together uh, at that point and led to um, Fire Park. But I, I just want to say a little, little word just about Priest Live. I feel like it's a forgotten uh, Priest record. CD, whatever. Worst um, packaging ever. Yes, very much so. That's Excellent why point. That's well why let's, let's, let's dig deep, shall we? Jesus Christ, this is really, really. <laughs> we've got song titles. Holy cow, that's interesting, isn't it? And look, we've got tiny, tiny, little, tiny little pictures, tiny little pictures. This is not like fucking get fault heaven, is it? And then at the back, we've got, oh, yay. <laughs> Oh, do you want to know that KK plays the lead on Breaking the Law? Not that much. I want big fuck off pictures, and I want and I want pictures of articulated lorries and everything else that you get with a proper uh, live album. But no, that's what we've got. But anyhow, uh, it just happens to come out around about the time time of Turbo. It's got the key songs from Turbo from Turbo on it. Uh, it's got all, all practically all the priests that you would ever ever require, uh, particularly you know in that mid you know mid to late eighties kind of thing. And it was. Even more than say British Steel, uh, you know the album that really cemented my love for the priest. I, I don't know why, because there are many better, um, there are better priest live albums than this. There are, there are better. It's just, it's just sentimental value. I just, yeah, it's not terrible by any means. It's, it's good. Yeah, it's just, just you know, oh, fuck it, that's terrible. Yeah, shite, yeah. isn't it? That's just I, really, I, I bought that on vinyl when it came out, and I was like, ah, "This looks like shit." And I'm like opening it up and saying, "I'm like, there's there's nothing else in here. Music's good. It's, good. it's a fun yeah. live album." But I mean, look at all those great live albums we got in the late '70s and early '80s, and then that. Mm. It's like, ugh. Yeah, just 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 you know, because we may never talk about the priest again. I'm really talking to you, Stephen. Even though you're a bit younger than me, aren't you? Um, do you remember the TV program Razzmatazz? I certainly do. Yes. Do you remember seeing the priest on Razzmatazz? No, I don't. I they did three wheel burning. It was fucking magnificent. All oh, these like, my, all these like, twelve year olds going, "What the fuck?" <laughs> <laughs> oh wow, I feel I've missed out in life. Yeah, maybe it's on YouTube somewhere. I haven't looked. Oh, it just, have it, look. it, it just, it just yeah. came into my head because do you know what? Do you know who else I remember on Rasmataz? <laughs> Yeah, I'm just saying. But yeah, you know, on the occasions they did make it into the main, on into the mainstream. Yeah, you know, if you look at uh, clips of the priest on top of the pops, you know, when people are trying to dance to United, you know, the, the, the bunch of gimps that are in the top of the pop studio, they're like, just, just very, very funny. Uh, yeah, <laughs> oh, I, I don't yeah. like United at all. But I love Free Will Burning, man. What a great song. United was a hit. I mean, they were at one point, you know, and so were Saxon and so were Iron Maiden. Uh, an absolute fixture on top of the pops, which went into like 20 odd million homes a week every Thursday, didn't it, in, Stephen, in the UK? Mm -hmm. you know, Absolutely. And they were there all the time, you know. Seek out Wheels of Steel by Saxon and the pops. It's just fantastic. Just awesome. Such yeah. A great song. Oh, oh, what are we doing? Oh, who are these? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> You know it when, when, are, when are ABBA going to come on? So we yeah. don't do this anymore, right? Where's the Brotherhood of Man? Pepsi and Shudley. So, yeah, anyhow. All right, Finished. Well, there, there you go. Well, I, I will be honest enough to admit, I instigated the wildcard idea. You and did. the reason for that was because there was a priest album that I wanted to talk about that was never going to be in my top two. 
and Simon's already bloody well spoken about it. <laughs> I thought, you know, somebody's going to have to stick up for Turbo. That's what I thought. I thought somebody's going to have to stick up for Turbo because, interestingly, and I forgot about it until you just mentioned United there. I was waiting to say that this was my entry into the priest. Okay. But it wasn't actually, it was the United seven inch single in the horrible paper sleeve with a hole in the middle with the kind of black sides and the white through the middle of it because that was what the record company, all the seven inch singles arrived in that. Mm -hmm. I forgot that my brother had that. Oh, probably back when it first came out. So we sang along with that but I had the vaguest idea who Judas Priest was. Probably before he even knew who Judas Priest was because that was a bona fide hit. But I was 13 when this album came out. And I will really and happily and proudly admit that I liked and like melodic rock. And this was the perfect bridge between what I was listening to and then when my brother said, well, actually, do you know, there's, there's other stuff that they've released that you would like too. And suddenly you kind of thought, well, hold on, you can do this heavy as shit stuff and I can still sing along with this. And when you're 13, you're kind of like, wow, that's amazing. Nobody does anything like this. And I mean, I'm just going to echo what Simon has, has mentioned earlier. Because the first six or seven songs on this album are just top-notch stuff. I mean, let's ignore the fact that it's got a phallic Mr. Whippy gear lever on the front. I mean, that I'm talking about them having really good album covers, and, and they are themed. And it is kind of themed. I mean, those two, they are themed. This is iconic. This is shit. <laughs> do you know? <laughs> it would take a great idea to do it really badly. But the album, I love this album. I absolutely love this album. Now, time and my interaction with the rest of the catalogue has moved it down the pecking order for me. But not because I like it any less, but just I like other albums more now. My tastes have, have evolved more than anything else. Not better, worse, not whatever. They're just a little different than they were back when I first heard this album. But this was on constant rotation in our house. If it wasn't getting played in my brother's room, it was getting played in my room. And I absolutely love Turbo. And I'm still really amazed, actually, at how little love there is for it. A lot of albums this far down the line, people turn around and kind of go, do you know, actually, I think we misunderstood that, and it's really good. Still not my favourite, but it's really good. There are still lots of Priest fans that will say to you, Turbo's just garbage, by the way. And I don't think it is. I really like Turbo. That was my wild card, and that was why I instigated it. But I'm actually really pleased that Simon actually took it out as one of his top two because it deserves that kind of recognition. Great album. Stephen, we, we are so correct. We are always so correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So I actually was kind of happy that you pushed for this wild card thing, and I thought long and hard about it, and I had like a selection of like three or four that uh, I was considering. And again, I wanted to, in, in, the, in the spirit of what we intended the wild card to be, it's, it's not nearly one of the best or one of our favorites. It's not nearly one of our least favorites. It kind of floats somewhere in the middle, like this amoeba that just kind of moves up and moves down, side to side. And we always are kind of like, yeah, I kind of like that album. I don't love that album. I don't hate that album. So I decided to go, and I'm actually glad I picked it today because Stephen picked it as one of his least favorites. I'm going to give a little bit of love to Rock and Roll of the Debut. And I, if we would have done this exercise maybe 20 years ago, it would have been one of my least favorites, I think. Because I, I, for years and years and years and years and years and years, uh, I used to just, just totally not give this any credence whatsoever. It's like, ah, it's the first album. It kind of sucks. It's like, it doesn't really sound like Priest. However, in my more recent older life, because I got the olds, uh, I found I really like early 70s bluesy heavy rock. I do. I love that style. And that's what this album is. I love One for the Road. I love Rockarola. Uh, Diamonds and Rust on here is really cool. The whole deep freeze, winter thing, whatever, cheater, never satisfied, uh, run of the mill. It's early priest. They don't know where the hell they're going yet, but there's a kind of moody, bluesy heaviness on here that I find a little appealing. I don't listen to this all that often, but now when I play it, I'm kind of like, yeah, that's baby priest trying to figure it all out. And it ain't terrible. It ain't great 
but it ain't terrible. Uh, so yeah, so I'm going to, this is kind of like a middle of the road priest album for me, but uh, there's enough to like on here, I think. So that's my one up card. I, I, I almost went with I almost went with Turbo as well. That was my number two choice, but I had a feeling that was going to show up one way or the other in some of our lists. So I said, you know what, I'll, I'm not going to go there today. I like how you got yourself out of the uh, amoeba simile. That was really good. I was quite impressed with the use of language there. Well done. <laughs> what I have liked is that I mean we didn't do a ranking top to bottom. You've you've already done a show on that. If anybody wants that, go watch Peter's excellent show on ranking the albums of Jesus Priest. But what I liked is that the my two choices for the wild card were either Turbo or Priest Live. I really like the fact that you've gone, your wild card was Rock and Roller, because I agree with everything that you've said. It it's kind of smacks to me of a band signed just a touch too soon, more than anything else. You know sometimes that you get those bootleg CDs or a retrospective thing where they go back and give you the first album and play you the demos. I think as a demos disc, rock and roller, you would listen to it and go, wow, that's really interesting how they got from there to Sad Wings in such a short space of time. What an amazing journey that was. But to me, rock and roller just stands out here because it sounds nothing like anything, really. I mean, Halford doesn't even sound like Halford on it. But it's not about no, that. really, yeah, yeah, you're right. But it's fascinating, I think, how much we've agreed while disagreeing or disagree whilst agreeing on all three of the best, worst, and wildcard categories. And it's been, I've really A lot liked. of variety here today, which was, I think that's one of the reasons why we picked Priest to go first in this little series. Yeah. I mean, do you got everybody watching. Do you like this kind of format? Because we, uh, we're planning on doing more of these. Anybody, anybody want to see Iron Maiden, perhaps? Let us know down below in the comments if you want to see us do this exact same thing for Iron Maiden in a couple of weeks. But before we do that, uh, we got a little rant coming up for you next week because we know everybody likes rants on this channel, right? Everybody loves rants. So we're going to talk a little bit next week about, uh, oh, some venues and policies and start times and end times and some things that are kind of pissing us off lately about uh, concerts and venues and things like that. So either it's going to be recent experiences or things that have happened in recent memory uh, where we're just a little upset about some things that have been happening at live shows. So that's coming up next week. Uh, Stephen, I don't know if you want to expand on that or Simon before we go. I came up with the idea for last week. So this, this must be there, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> I might have done my thinking for this quarter. Oh, okay. <laughs> the, the rationale behind this, and without we'll, going too deep into it, because I'll end up just doing the rant, is that I was at a concert uh, within the last couple of weeks. Uh, and, and I feel that I was, not just me, there was a group of about maybe 30 people treated really, really shoddily by the venue that we were in. Not by the band, we had all had a great night, but it ended on a real low, and it could have been handled so much better, so much more professionally, and it could have been, you could actually, we could have left it going, wow, they did such a good job of that. And there were 20 or 30, maybe slightly more people in that, that all left going, well, that's made a fantastic night, just a little bit shit. And, and as you can probably tell, it's still under my skin. So yes, I right. really want to rant so about it. Stay tuned for the full story next week and other stories, because I've got stuff to tell as well. So again, this is not going to be directed at any bands uh, per se, but more on kind of what has happened at specific venues. I know, you know, Simon has touched on specific venues that he, have, he has been to uh, in recent memory or even farther back that he tries to avoid because of certain things. I, I've had the same thing happen here. So it's more going to be us telling some stories about some, you know, shitty treatment and things going on at certain venues at certain concerts. So that's coming up next week. A little kind of spontaneous rant because, uh, you know, we got to do these every now and then, right? And then uh, we'll be returning the week after that with more stuff. If you guys really want to see that uh, two favorites, two least favorites in wild card of Iron Maiden, let us know because we'll gladly do that. That should, that, that'll be very similar to what you saw today. So, uh, so but we're going to do it anyhow, aren't we? Let's be well, we are going to do it anyhow. Regardless, even if it's, nobody comments, it's coming. <laughs> I'm going to use all my other profiles in the bottom now. <laughs> that is correct. So, uh, so thanks for watching, everybody. Hope you have a uh, great rest of the weekend. Thanks for spending some part of your Saturday with us. 
uh, for Stephen Reed and Simon Bray. I am Pete Pardo. Thanks for watching the UK Connection. We'll be right back at you one week from today. So take care. Visit us on the web, www.death. Boy, that's 6.5 went right to my head. Holy <laughs> this is on the web at www. And he's already drank too. So yeah, there you go. Shows you how much of a lightweight I am. Uh, where was I? www.ctranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. See everybody. For Simon and Steve and I and Pete, have a good one, everybody. <laughs>